So today I'm going to wanting to talk about the meaning and significance of place um, in a geopolitical and cultural context and in relation to the politics of identity and representation. Recently I've been thinking quite a lot about some of these issues um, in relation to globalisation and migration. And my PhD research, as Aaron mentioned, um, looked at, um, I guess, the politics of place in Taiwan, which is something I'm going to talk a little bit more about today, um, and um, identity politics. These issues of place and placelessness or displacement, um, uh, also some of the themes I've explored in exhibitions, um, such as Ireland, which, I'll, which Aaron mentioned and which I'll also mentioned today, face-to-face, um, -face, um, I mean, there, it, it, I guess either explicitly or implicitly, that has been a fair, fairly kind of um, uh, um, concurrent sort of a theme that's kind of run, uh, been as a sort of thread throughout the, the exhibitions I've curated. And as we saw this morning in, in the exhibition Home in um, Zhang Chen Chi's work, um, these issues of, of home, of of place, of displacement, um, are very much part of his um, artistic practice as well, as both a photo, um, working in the photo documentary genre, as well as an artist uh, in an artistic context. So in an exhibition context, where do we locate ourselves as a curator and member of the audience? and indeed as an artist, in relation to the subject who occupies a place or a space that may be regarded as contentious or off limits, um, and that may question or challenge our um, ethical boundaries. Um, so the key kind of questions I'm wanting to put forward today is how has globalisation and increased mobility and hyperconnectivity affected our sense of place and identity or to put it another way, how has it shaped and defined our notions of belonging, of citizenship and agency? How do we imagine the place in which we live today? And how do we locate and define ourselves within it? With the rise and spread of globalisation, increased mobility and advancement in, di in digital technology, there's been significant discussion about the idea of place. Um, in relation to the erosion of um, the nation and of uh, national boundaries. Um, however, it's hard to see, I feel, any evidence of this here in Australia. Our nation's borders are, according to our current government, clearly demarcated. And the government remains intent on turning back the boats. So those who have actually um, um, uh, challenge those boundaries, I suppose, um, in our sea zone. Also, with the funding and media coverage given to the Anzac uh, centenary celebration, it appears our sense of nationhood in Australia remains strong. Of course, there are some scholars and commentators who argue that globalisation has in fact given rise to a process of what I might describe as re-territorialisation rather than de-territorialisation and to a stronger sense of place and national identity. Indeed, we can see evidence of this in the recent dispute over the Diaoyutai Islands um, in the South China Seas, which China and Japan uh, both claim as part of their territory. With China's growing power and influence in the region, we wit we've witnessed large-scale protests in both Taiwan and Hong Kong both of whom seek to protect their territory and democratic rights. Um, so I've just got a couple of images there of the Sunflower Movement in Taiwan, which was a student-led, I don't know if many of you have actually heard about this, but it was a student-led protest um, that was really, um, I guess the key issue was the uh, service trade uh, agreement which the Taiwan government was endeavouring to um, uh, sign with uh, the Chinese government, which many Taiwanese feel will comp compromise their, um, uh, their democratic rights as China's gaining increasing um, power and in, in, in control over, over Taiwan through its sort of economic might. And of course, Occupy Hong Kong um, 
uh, on the TV we saw sort of large scale demonstrations and um, uh, against the uh, Chinese government's uh, interference in its political, or it was actually, the protest was about seeking to redefine Hong Kong's political constitution um, uh, so that Hong Kongese could not only nominate potential candidates um, for government, but actually um, uh, elect them because at the moment the Chinese government is actually um, electing or selecting the candidates which Hong Kongese put forward. So Hong Kongese don't have actually direct control over their election process. Um, unlike Hong Kong, Taiwan has so far managed to retain some degree of political and cultural autonomy and issues of place, belonging and citizenship are particularly important and I'll return to Taiwan and the ways artists are responding to these issues later in this talk. The term intercultural, which was in the sort of subtitle of this talk, um, most clearly expresses where I situate, situate myself as a curator, located between places. And this in-between space I see is quite fluid and, and unstable. Unlike the term transculturalism, which is um, uh, widely used and which to me suggests an ability to transcend borders and boundaries, interculturalism, on the other hand, draws attention to the relational aspects of curating and it highlights the tensions and the challenges a curator faces as a cultural mediator negotiating the local, regional and global. Um, I like Mary Louise Pratt's idea of contact zones, which she defines as spaces where disparate cultures meet, clash and grapple with each other. In her book, Imperial Eyes, she describes contact zones in relation to colonial encounters. When people geographically and historically separated come into contact with each other and establish ongoing relations. The term contact foregrounds the interactive di dimensions of these encounters. It emphasises how subjects are constituted in and by their relations to each other. Exhibitions, in my view, um, are by their very nature interactive and relational, involving artists, curators, audiences and institutions in a process of dialogue and exchange. In an intercultural context, curators are mediators and translators, working within and between different countries and, and cultures, bringing together and interpreting a collection of works to engage and inspire audiences and sometimes to challenge them. This curato curatorial process, of course, is not a passive or neutral process. There are decisions to be made that, are, that have cultural and political consequences and there are often uh, tensions and, ag and agendas, especially when working with government agencies and in countries where there is conflict or whose identities and future remain uncertain. For the past 20 years, I've been living and working in Taiwan and China, which have been political rivals since 1949. Notwithstanding the warming of relations over the past decade under the current president, Ma Ying-jeou, um, between Taiwan and China, identity issues remain at the forefront of national debate in Taiwan, which fiercely protects its democratic status and de facto sovereignty. Taiwan, and I should make a distinction here, I'm, I'm sure you're all very familiar with um, where Taiwan is, but um, a lot of people when I was going to Taiwan often would say, well, have a great time at the beach, thinking it was Thailand, but of course, <laughs> Taiwan is situated sort of on the periphery of China across the, the Taiwan Straits. Um, so here I'm talking about Taiwan. Taiwan is an economically prosperous, globally connected and cosmopolitan society, but the politics of identity, place and representation are issues that still resonate strongly. There are several, um, several reasons for this which are a bit too complex to discuss here, but Taiwan's history of foreign colonisation, and specifically the 50 years of Japanese colonisation, 
and the brutality inflicted upon the local Taiwanese and Indigenous people by the Chinese uh, Nationalist Party or KMT when they arrived in Taiwan in 1949 are also important factors. Also, when Taiwan was officially expelled from the United Nations in 1971 and replaced by China, marked a critical turning point in its quest, in Taiwan's quest for national identity and international recognition. In 1987, following years of extraordinary economic growth, massive industrialisation and urban development, Ma uh, martial law, which had been in force for 38 years, which is actually the longest period that any country has actually had martial law over a continuous period, was lifted and it marked the beginning of Taiwan's process of democratisation. During this time, a multi-party political system was introduced and restrictions on the media and freedom of speech were officially abolished. And in 1996, the first Taiwan-born president, who was interestingly Japanese-educated, Li Denghui, was also for the first time popularly elected by the people. During the mid-1990s, when I was living in Taiwan, there was a significant upsurge of political and cultural nationalism that was characterised by the desire to rediscover and define a sense of place, identity and belonging. There was also a growing anti-China sentiment that was sparked by the Taiwan Straits crisis when the Chinese government fired a series of missiles across the strait over a period of three years, which it justified as a, a military test, but clearly it was um, doing so to intimidate um, the Taiwanese. The elections were, were coming up and they were trying to, um, um, I guess, um, intimidate pro-independent supporters. After decades of political and cultural repression, the desire to discover, recover and redefine Taiwan's identity and its indigenous and local culture were of utmost importance to many artists in Taiwan and particularly those Taiwanese artists who were born and raised in Taiwan. And here I think it's important to make a distinction between um, the Taiwanese who arrived in Taiwan prior to 1949 when the Chinese nationalists arrived uh, in Taiwan after being defeated against the communists and um, the so-called uh, mainlanders that came with the um, KMT. Um, and when I was living there, there was that distinction was uh, very clearly demarcated. And they, the people who arrived prior to 1949 were um, defined as Taiwanese, as distinct from mainlanders. And so that term Taiwanese is quite politically loaded and we need to be quite careful, I think, when we're talking about Taiwanese art to actually recognise that, um, that um, sort of political nuance. Um, so many, uh, so th these issues of identity were of also of utmost importance to many artists in Taiwan, as I mentioned, particularly those who were born and raised there. Many of them were painters, but they also included artists such as uh, this photographer Chen Shunshu, who was actually uh, born and raised on Penghu Island, which is actually on the uh, south east coast of off Taiwan, off the mainland. Um, when I first met Chen Shunchu, I, I was doing a series of interviews with artists uh, for uh, what was then a, a master's thesis and um, a number of artists introduced the first thing they actually said to me was, uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Taiwanese person, so this, this distinguishing themselves again from the mainlanders. Um, and with, when I first met Chen Shunchu, he showed me this series called Family Parade, which he'd taken on the island of Penghu. And it was a, 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 a quite a um, strange um, discussion for me as, a, as a, I'd, I'd not long been living in Taiwan, I think probably just a um, couple of months. And he came out with his statement saying, well, my work is very Taiwanese. And I said, well, how do you define that? How do you characterise that? And he said, well, firstly, I, I'm, I'm born and raised in Taiwan, but 
Also, my work is very different from foreign artists' work and he used Anselm Kiefer as, as an example because he'd just been to Germany and seen Kiefer's work. And I thought this was a really sort of incongruous and, and strange statement to make, but it was actually quite um, typical of a lot of the comments that I was hearing amongst artists in Taiwan and it's at this particular time. And it's hard to just dismiss it as a form of cultural essentialism. I mean, in, in many would argue that that's what it is. And certainly, um, you know, there was a very strong nationalist subtext. But, um, you know, it was, it was, I guess, to me, a kind of illustration of the struggle that many artists were facing to actually define their identity through their work. So this series, Family Parade, um, he explores notions of memory and place. Um, as you can see here, um, it's, a, it's an abandoned building on the island of Penghu where he's um, placed um, hundreds of photographs who are actually his, uh, of his family, black and white photographs, eight by ten, of his uh, family, mem close family members and friends. And um, there's, another, it's, it's the, the, and there's another work where he actually plants these photographs into a peanut field and Peng Hu used to have quite a strong peanut industry which has now sort of um, uh, disappeared and Peng Hu has become a, a, a sort of tourist destination partly because they've just built a huge casino there. So, um, so in some ways, you know, there's a very sort of nostalgic longing in, in, in these works, I find. Um, and um, sort of an unravelling of lost histories. So I, I sort of viewed it as a way of coming, coming to terms with the complex and deep-rooted changes um, which define Taiwan's present reality. Uh, this is an artist called Yare Zhong, um, who's featured in a couple of my exhibitions. Um, uh, uh, and I'll show a couple of his uh, uh, more recent works later. This was a very early work um, series that he did called Territory Takeover. And uh, it was created, it was, it's the, the Territory take Takeover draws on the age old Chinese political slogan, expel the barbarians and recover lost land, um, which was of course in, in reference to um, the indigenous people and, and um, the local Taiwanese who were living in Taiwan uh, before the KMT arrived. And in this series, this is just one, um, one work from the series. Um, there's actually six, six works and this is just a um, scan from a catalogue that um, he visits six historically significant sites around the island where the colonial um, explore, uh, clo foreign colonial explorers and settlers arrived, so at the point of arrival. And um, here it's where the Spanish arrived. Um, and he literally sort of strips naked and urinates on the site, um, like a sort of dog marking its territory, I suppose. Um, and um, I mean, some of you will know, I, I should just mention Taiwan's history of for, foreign colonisation has included the Dutch who were there in the 1600s, um, the Spanish just before them, um, later the, um, the Japanese in 1895. So there's sort of been a, a wave of, of um, foreign, um, uh, sort of foreign interception and colonisation um, in the country in Taiwan. Um, so this series explores notions of uh, history, identity and nostalgia from a more humorous or satirical perspective. Um, uh, I should just mention the toilet. Um, it's a um, reference to what Yao calls uh, shittery. Um, where he describes Taiwan's history as shittery, partly in, 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 in reference to the, its history of um, coloni foreign colonisation um, and the kind of marking of, of territory. But also it was, um, this series was created in response to um, the kind of uh, wave of Taiwanese nationalism that was sweeping the island where politicians were sort of accusing each other of not being Taiwanese or, you know, questioning their, their, um, their kind of, um, their family heritage. I mean, just like 
Obama, I suppose, and his family heritage was, was questioned. Um, so very strong sort of uh, nationalistic um, uh, debate that was happening at that time. Yao's a writer and a, and a photographer and a, um, he's amassed a, an amazing archive of, um, of documents. Um, uh, so a, a lot of his, his uh, practice has been research led. Um, the archive actually, um, he's, he's donated it to the Asian Art Archive in Hong Kong. So um, if any of you are interested in um, exploring that, it's there um, online, I think. This is, uh, I just thought I'd put in this work just to provide a little bit more context to his practice. Um, this was a work he did, um, series he did in 1997 where he visited mainland China. He's quite typical of many um, artists in Taiwan who have one Taiwanese um, parent or one parent who's been born in Taiwan and another parent who, um, who came from mainland China with the KMT. So Yao's father was actually a KMT soldier in the army. And Yao actually has um, a lot of uh, step relatives, um, sisters and brothers, family in, in mainland China. And he went to mainland China for the first time because prior to the lifting of martial law, people weren't allowed to go to mainland China. So he visited mainland China and uh, his, he, he went there ostensibly to meet his relatives. But in the end, he, he never made contact. And this series is very much sort of about that um, experience in some ways where he, he visited various um, historical sites. Of course, this is um, the Forbidden City um, in China and he, he, he jumps off the ground, um, photographs himself jumping off the ground, you know, as a metaphor of kind of never landing, never, never actually arriving in China, never feeling sort of um, that sense of home, which his generation and earlier generations had, of course, through the education system in Taiwan, been told that China was the motherland um, and that it was their home. And eventually the idea, nationalist idea, would that, was that the Chinese um, would return to mainland China. Of course, you know, that never happened. So um, these photo, these, oh, and this is a series he did on Chinatown. And, this, these were the actual works that I presented um, in the exhibition uh, Face to Face, which I curated in 1999. It was held in conjunction um, with the Asia Pacific Triennial, um, at which for the first time in 1999 included works from Taiwan. Um, but interestingly, they represented Taiwan um, under the kind of rubric of, of, of this one China policy, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, but as representing the artists as coming from Taipei, China, which was slightly problematic because a number of the artists didn't come from Taipei, the capital city, they came from other cities in Taiwan. So, um, but of course, you know, that, that kind of um, issue was not a lot of the members of the audience who went to the APT didn't actually, weren't aware of that particular issue. And um, the organisers certainly didn't highlight it because they were worried about mainland China, um, uh, um, you know, um, making an issue of it, I suppose, political issue, um, and withdrawing from the APT. So this work, Chinatown, the, the work on the right is actually a work he made in Brisbane um, when, when we were, um, as, as, and it was shown as part, part of the exhibition Face to Face. Um, so in these works, he's actually looking at slightly different issues in relation to globalisation and, um, and uh, the diaspora, the Chinese diaspora. And in it, he features himself once again under the gate. And some of you might know um, who can read Chinese, but under a lot of the gates, it's, 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 it's called the Gate of, of Heavenly Peace. Um, and uh, so the idea is that it's, you know, about peace and, and prosperity. 
and I guess yeah, sort of challenging that idea because he's got his hands up in the air um, as if he's going to be shot and um, you know he's alluding to kind of not just immigration authorities but also to um, the sense of kind of displacement that um, uh, I guess many Chinese feel and I think that was really evocatively captured in um, uh, Zhang Chenqi's um, uh, Chinatown series that we saw today in the home exhibition. And uh, Chen Jie Ren, um, these were also shown in the exhibition face to face. Um, many of you will be familiar with Chen Jie Ren. I think he's become quite uh, famous internationally, mainly as a filmmaker. These were quite early works that he did. Um, they were um, quite monumentally large, um, digitally uh, manipulated uh, photographs about three metres wide. And um, it was part of his, his series, The Revolt um, in the Body and Soul. And in it, he, he situates himself um, in the image of image of identical twins, that's actually him shown as a kind of two two um, headed creature, and um, the it's quite confronting, I guess, with the with the um, you know the, the decapitated heads, and that's a reference to the um, period of Japanese colonisation when a number of um, uh, um, the the Japanese government. Um, uh, inculcated a, a, another a indigenous tribe to actually kill the other tribe. And in this image, it's, it's actually taken from the boxer, an image from, the, so he appropriates an historical photograph and then digitally manipulates it. And here he's represented as the kind of, um, the perpetrator uh, who's in the background as well as the victim. So he's kind of questioning um, these ideas of, of um, history and the construction of history. Um, and of, um, you know, the whole kind of concept of good and evil, I suppose, which is relating to the idea of karma, the Buddhist notion of karma. Um, so, internationally, the issue of naming and representing Taiwan remains a problematic issue. To title is to entitle, and more often than not, exhibition organisers, at least those seeking to avoid controversy, use the word Chinese Taipei or Taipei China instead of using the word Taiwan, as the Chinese government insists organisers conform to its one China policy. Of course, as I mentioned, that presents a problem for artists who are not from Taipei. Although most nations in the world support the One China policy, it does not stop the Taiwan government, members of the audience or artists from demonstrating against the ways Taiwan is represented in international forums. And here I'm getting to the politics of representation. Most recently, the president's wife cancelled a visit to Japan, where she was to attend the official opening of an exhibition of artefacts from Taiwan's National Palace Museum because the Japanese organisers in Tokyo publicised it as the exhibition coming from the Palace Museum, uh, deleting the word national, which obviously has political implications. And Beijing also has a National Palace Museum, so obviously, you know, the Japanese government felt that they needed to um, sort of recognise mainland China over Taiwan in this particular instance. Another example relating to the politics of representing Taiwan uh, which, I, which is worthy to note, um, was in the 2004 Shanghai Biennale. In it, a wall label that you can see here, sorry about the quality of the slide, but um, it was displayed alongside a work by um, artist Chen Jie Ren, whose work I just showed earlier. And it had been repeatedly vandalised by members of the audience who clearly held strong views on the One China issue. On the original label, the artist was acknowledged as coming from Taipei, China. The exhibition was held in Shanghai, so that's not surprising. Which a member of the audience had crossed out, obviously Taiwanese, and replaced with Taiwan. And another subsequent, subsequently replaced it with the word China. In addition, on the top of this small label, the Chinese cut characters, some of you might be able to read it, um, saying communism will liberate Taiwan, were boldly inscribed. And in response, another visitor wrote world peace people in English. As this and other more recent international incidences and exhibitions demonstrate, the politics of Taiwan's international representation 
continues to be a sticking point in the development of Taiwan-China relations. Now this is a work by Chen Jie Ren again, um, and I, I talked a little bit about this work in, the, in my catalogue essay in the home um, exhibition catalogue, which um, most of you will have, will have read, I think. Um, but it was called Empire's Borders, and in this series it was shown as part of the Venice Biennale in 2009. Um, and in it he really addresses the politics of Taiwan's identity. In the first part of this two-part film, the artist recounts the stories of eight women from Taiwan whose non-immigrant non visa applications to the US were refused. This segment of the film was inspired by Chen's own experience when his application for a short-term non-immigration non US visa was not only rejected, but he himself was apparently treated in quite a demeaning manner by the American consular official in Taiwan, who allegedly believed he was um, seeking to immigrate illegally to the US, when in fact he was invited to attend an exhibition opening of his work. According to various curators and critics from Taiwan, as well as in, uh, from the media, this film captures the experiences of many Taiwan citizens when their visa applications to vi visit the West, especially to America, are rejected by immigration officials. Subsequent to creating this work, Chen set up a website called The Illegal Immigrant, where he invited other people from Taiwan to share their experiences, and within days, this blog got hundreds of responses. Chen's work directly engages in the politics of cold, uh, uh, sorry, engages in post-Cold post War politics, underscoring the continuing uh, dominant role the US has played both in Taiwan and globally. He asserts it, and this is a quote, this is not merely a powerful nation's policy to control its borders and the movement of its populations, and the movement of populations, but it's also an extemporaneous martial law measure that the Americans enact in the name of fighting terrorism <coughs> and a disciplined strategy employed by a powerful country on the people of a weaker land, an ongoing public works project by an empire meaning to tame its territories. While the US is still regarded as Taiwan's ally and plays, an, of course, and plays an important role in the Asian region, the centre of power has shifted and increasingly people in Taiwan and Asia more generally, including Hong Kong and Vietnam, are becoming more concerned with China's growing power in the region. How we locate ourselves, um, so I'm sort of wanting now to get on to how the curatorial context and how we locate ourselves as a curator within this complex geopolitical um, terrain. And um, this is um, how do we negotiate the politics of place and identity. And this is an issue that I'm, I'm facing now um, in an exhibition that I'm curating and it's still developing, um, it's still in its fairly early stages, so I don't want to sort of talk too much about the specifics and the, the images I'm going to show here are not confirmed works, so um, it's just a kind of um, sample, I suppose, of what I'm going to talk about um, as a sort of um, a phenomenon, a, a trend that's um, gaining increasing sort of popularity in, in um, the, what I might call here the Greater China region. So this exhibition that I'm curating um, brings together works from Taiwan, Hong Kong and China. And I'm already facing the issue of naming, not just in terms of Taiwan, but also what term do you use when you actually are um, uh, selecting work from these three different places, which China, you know, Hong Kong's um, regarded officially as part of China. Uh, Taiwan, um, according to, to many countries in the world, it, it is too, but it's a, a to call and to, to refer to an exhibition like this as Chinese art, I have um, difficulties with, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a kind of um, issue, I suppose, that we as curators um, may face when we're actually including works from all three places. And particularly when working with government funding, um, government funded cultural institutions as I am, and funding bodies um, that have their own policies and agendas. 
um, where, and these issues have significant political, diplomatic and economic consequences. So just, I'm just going to really lightly, sort of, you know, briefly touch on, on um, some of the ideas I'm exploring on, on this exhibition and then I, I want to um, finish with, a, with a, another exhibition. Um, so this exhibition focuses on the contemporary significance of ink and contemporary art from Hong Kong, Taiwan and China. Um, as many of you might know, um, particularly those who have been living uh, in um, the region, in recent years, Chinese ink art has been attracting increasing global attention and the Met has actually just showed it had a major, um, uh, well, I wouldn't say actually major, it was a, one of their first um, shows of contemporary um, Chinese art that they've had for a very long time, um, looking at this um, kind of um, ink art trend. But uh, there was quite a lot of criticism about that show because um, the Met, as some of you might know in New York, has quite a um, significant collection of um, historical Chinese art, artefacts and, and sort of pre-20th century um, uh, works. And so contemporary, these works, which they, they only focused on mainland China, um, uh, but they were situated within this, um, uh, their, their uh, their, their display of their collection of historical kind of artefacts, Chinese artefacts, and a lot of the artists had a real problem with that um, because essentially it's, I guess, um, uh, um, defining ink art as a very traditional medium that hasn't sort of moved forward in some ways. And this is something that I'm sort of looking at and, and questioning and, and countering, um, I hope, in this exhibition. Um, so broadly speaking, my objective is to open up several lines of inquiry relating to the development of contemporary ink art and its various manifestations. Um, and I should say I'm not, a lot of the works are um, digital works, so they're not, they're not literally ink painting, although this one by Chu Jiujie, um, which I selected because he was one of the um, leaders of the curatorial intensive a couple of years ago, as Aaron mentioned, and I think um, talked about this series. Um, uh, so um, he's working, I guess, in the more traditional format in terms of the scroll and actually using ink, um, brush and ink, um, or shui mo, as the Chinese describe it, um, in his work. But here I think he's really subverting the whole uh, kind of tradition of, of um, uh, classical Chinese ink painting in terms of landscape painting, um, which is referred to as shan shui, or literally water mountain, um, mountain water painting um, and looking at issues of, of globalisation and industrialisation and it's a kind of, as, a, as the title suggests, it's a, it's, a, it's a mapping of the land from a you know, bird's eye kind of perspective, from a topographical perspective. And Feng Min Bo, um, who I've talked in relation to some of the um, uh, um, issues Robin was raising in relation to um, digital art and, and post-internet art. And Femme Bo is one of the artists who um, was, as many of you will be familiar with his works, I think he was working um, typically in sort of video gaming, creating works based on video games. And they're quite um, criticised as being quite violent works, but um, I think, you know, certainly very interactive. But he's, uh, I guess, an example of um, uh, of a generation of artists in, Thai, in uh, China now, from mainland China here, um, looking at this um, kind of tradition, ink tradition, but reinterpreting it in a very contemporary way using, um, I mean here he's using inkjet um, and applying sort of ink and uh, uh, tea and um, onto the, the work. Um, so it's again a sort of mapping of the landscape, drawing on that sort of shan shui tradition um, the, the work on the left is, is drawing on a calligraphic tradition, but you can see that you know, it's, it's, it's quite removed from that tradition as well. So I'm sort of curious why um, artists such as, as uh, Feng Minbo may be turning to tradition, um, whether it's in relation to the kind of um, rapid pace of, of modernisation and industrialisation 
um, the effects of globalisation in China, you know, this kind of idea of the lost history. But um, I also have a suspicion that it's, it, there's a kind of um, Chinese nationalist subtext under this as well, um, in that there's this kind of discourse emerging, which I think has actually been around for a while, but it seems to have kind of gained, um, uh, it's become more prevalent in that there, this kind of polarisation of the East and West, which I find a bit, you know, problematic, if not a bit disturbing in a way, in that um, many of these Chinese artists I was talking to, and this is just recently, I've just come back, were um, saying, well, you know, you, Western art, the, the Western art, uh, the art historical kind of canon has been written by Westerners, which, you know, many of us might agree with. But, um, you know, why do Westerners not know about Dong Chi Chang or Ni Zhan or, you know, these artists in China who, um, you know, 14th, 15th century, um, you know, these were our masters. So, you know, there's a question, I think, there about this kind of, um, uh, of, of why these artists are referring to the past. Is it a, a way in which they're trying to kind of reconstruct the past, but also that I think there's a celebratory aspect of this too. China is an economic power. It also has, you know, cultural tradition, however far it goes back. And this, this artist, you may have seen it, White Rabbit. Um, uh, they showed this work uh, a couple of years ago, I think, by Chen Xiaoxiong, um, this kind of rewriting of history um, and reflecting on, I guess, China's um, role um, in the kind of global community and the effects of globalisation in the, the work in media. Um, and his works are sort of animation, video based. Uh, Pan Xinhua, who's from Taiwan, um, these I guess are, um, seem to be, uh, you know, uh, um, on the surface at least more traditional works and they're done in the kind of literati painting style, but he kind of subverts that <coughs> Um, and they're quite sort of humorous but also quite political in a way because a number of his works actually, I don't know if you can see here in the, the right image, the map of Taiwan and he's really I guess trying to assert um, Taiwan's identity in, in these works in terms of its own kind of local cultural tradition um, and there's a sort of folk art element to these works I think as well. And then Xu Reixian whose works you may also have seen, I think it's still on the current show at, at White Rabbit, uh, The Eight Drunken Immortals where uh, he works with uh, robotics. Uh, typically uh, Xu Reixian's work is um, uh, works with sort of uh, digital media, but interactive, um, and and tends to work a lot with with uh, sort of robotic devices as well. And here, you know, the the robotic is this, it's on wheels and it kind of spreads as it moves around. It's sensor driven and it moves around um, on the um, sort of canvas, um, sort of creating this this ink work. So. One of the questions I'm interested in exploring in this exhibition is why contemporary artists in this region are now turning to ink as a source of artistic inspiration when only a decade ago they resisted or rejected Chinese cultural tradition and looked to the West for inspiration. So what has triggered this cultural turn? Um, of course, there are economic factors that need to be considered in terms of the art market and also political factors in relation to China's growing influence and power in the region and the world as a whole. Um, in societies which have undergone such massive change over such a short period, it might also be argued that these artists are turning to the past in an effort to make sense of the present. And I just, um, so now I just wanted finish with an exhibition I curated when I was the um, director of the Adam Art Gallery in New Zealand. Um, and this was quite a different curatorial model um, that, that, um, uh, I, that was employed in this exhibition where it was very much collaboration and a conversation um, between myself and the co-curators Lee Wing Choi, who's um, many of you may have um, heard of. He's a uh, uh, quite a prolific writer, um, uh, commentator um, on um, 
uh, a range of, of, of topics, but generally he's, he's Singapore based um, and he's, he's uh, more recently curated a couple, of, a couple of exhibitions. The other curator was Eugene Tan, who's the current director of the uh, National Art Museum in Singapore. But at the time he was director of the La Salle Gallery um, uh, University Art Museum in Singapore. So this exhibition was called Islanded and um, uh, Islanded Contemporary Art from New Zealand, Singapore and Taiwan. Um, this exhibition explored the idea of place and the politics of place from a very different perspective. As the title suggests, we focused on the idea of the island. We used island as a verb. Um, in relation to the idea of arrival, you know, as a sense of we've made it. Um, but it also implies a point of departure to arrive, you've also got to depart. So it was also um, uh, looking at sort of migration histories of um, Singapore, Taiwan and, and uh, New Zealand. And we saw the idea of islanded as, as never being a complete process. It was the process of arrival and of departure, of a feeling of, of never quite belonging, of standing apart um, uh, in, a, in a new place. Um, the exhibition explored issues relating to all three countries' colonial and migration histories, and it reflected on the anxieties, the hopes and the desires of when we arrive in a new place and our need to survive. I guess it was about sort of being on the edge and you could kind of see New Zealand, Singapore and, and Taiwan as sort of linked peripheries in a way, um, uh, both in a sort of geographical, geopolitical and, and cultural context. We're interested in the idea of the individual encounter, how we encounter a place, um, and which is often sort of conditioned by accident or by a series of accidents. Um, I arrived in Canberra seven years ago and I never thought I'd stay. It was very much kind of an accident that I was there in some ways. Going back to Mary Louise Pratt's idea of contact zones, we viewed the island in this exhibition as a node that is intersected by local, regional, political and cultural <coughs> influences and tensions. This isn't actually the, the cover of the exhibition, um, but it was a... a a design that was developed by one of the artists, Charles Lim, which I actually think is probably a better catalogue cover to the, than the one that we use, but um, certainly more pertinent to this discussion, I think. So, um, Ho Zun Yen, I just want to talk a little bit, bit now about the artists um, in the show and um, some of the issues they were exploring. Um, so Ho Zun Yen um, is a writer, a filmmaker and an artist um, and he's done quite a lot of research into history and the idea of the kind of um, construction of the historical um, canon or the grand narrative and how this may um, sort of be part of a process of kind of myth making. And, um, the work uh, Utama, Every Name in History, is I, uh, was, is part of a series, that's the work on the right, is part of a series. Utama was actually refers to the uh, Sang Nila Utama, um, who was a legendary pre-colonial um, founder of Singapore. And of course, you know, there's all these kind of foundation myths about most um, countries and, and Singapore certainly um, has a number of them. Um, and um, this series was, is, is a based on, a, on um, uh, includes sort of paintings and film-based works. Um, and he's interested, Ho Zun Yen's interested in this, this kind of um, juxtaposition um, or disjuncture between um, uh, 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 documentary um, and fiction, how we construct a story, how we construct a sense of place. Yare Jong, whose works I showed earlier um, from Taiwan, this was a um, uh, more recent series he did um, uh, called Long March Shifted the Universe. And again, you know, it features Yao. Um, this time um, the image has been reversed. 
um, where he's, he's shown, it's a bit disorientating, I know, but he's actually, um, you know, shown doing a handstand, as we see it, he's doing a handstand, but, um, you know, in a logical sense, the work should actually be round the other way. Um, and, uh, you know, and I guess that picks up on the idea of shifting the universe. This work was actually part of a, um, a, a <coughs> fairly long-term project that which the Long March um, Institute, uh, the Long March um, organisation um, uh, initiated, uh, Long March being in, in the organisation in Beijing, which now has a gallery at um, 798. And, um, Yao was actually invited as one of the participants to join um, this project and um, uh, I'm not going to go into the history of the Long March, M many of you may know it, um, but um, here Yao actually, um, he's looking at the idea of going to get back to kind of Taiwan's political history, what if the KMT, what if the Chinese nationalists actually won the war against the Chinese, the civil war against the Chinese communists, you know, again looking at how, um, sort of looking at the, 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 the concept of history and how, how if we kind of reversed history or how, how if things um, happened differently, where would we be today? Where would, we, um, where would he find his sense of place um, and belonging? This is the work by um, Annie O'Neill, the work on the left um, called uh, Kikau Tips. Um, from, which was part of a larger project, the Island Broom project, which also involved, included a video work. Um, and Annie's um, of, uh, from Rarotonga, um, which is the capital of the Cook Islands, um, and she uh, regularly returns to Rarotonga. And in this work, she actually has made um, uh, brooms out of coconut, um, you know, the, the outside of, of coconuts. Um, whisk brooms that have, uh, have traditionally been used in Rarotonga. Um, and she's looking at the kind of um, uh, sort of economic colonisation, if you like, of uh, the Pacific um, and Rarotonga specifically, where there's a lot of Asian investment, Taiwan and China investment especially. And, you know, and this, uh, where these brooms are, are being replaced by sort of mass produced um, uh, factory line brooms. Um, so, and she, she's kind of displayed them as artefacts with these tags attached to them. Um, the image doesn't really do justice to the work, but it was quite a poetic work and, and complemented very much by the video. Um, on the right is Richard Colleen's work. Richard is quite a well known New Zealand artist. Um, and. Uh, this work, Man in a Canoe with Land, looks at the kind of New Zealand's history of colonisation. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it's fairly self-explanatory, but um, the, the, the composition of the work is um, uh, drawing on the kind of, um, the colonial um, explorers' um, drawings um, you know, on, the, on their scientific exploration their, um, where they did their drawings, you know, that were often sort of scattered kind of drawings in a, in a book. And um, so he's referring to this, this idea of colonial encounter um, and uh, settlement. And I think in this work, the kind of space in between the ocean, which we, um, you know, as an absent space in this work, um, I think is, is really important too, is um, sort of uh, to think about. And this work, which I'm going to end on, um, is by Regan Gentry, um, who's a New Zealand artist, um, quite young artist at the time anyway. Um, and uh, he did a, a really beautiful work called Common Cold and it was a very um, simple and quite humorous work where, uh, video based work, um, where, which I think really captures this sense of being islanded, um, of being on the edge, um, you know, nowhere, man, nowhere land in, in, a, in a way. Um, and he, um, 
he basically, it's, it's a piece of toilet paper which um, sort of unravels as he, um, as he, when he let it go and, and he documents this kind of unravelling and, and I think Regan's really interested in the, um, the kind of uh, conjunction between the mundane or kind of the everyday and the sublime and uh, here I think the image on the right kind of really captures that that idea um, quite beautifully. Um, and um, yeah, I think, you know, it, it explores the idea of um, also, yeah, an important element of Re Regan's work is that he's, he's looking at the, um, the tradition of landscape painting in New, in New Zealand, which is, has a very strong um, tradition, um, similar to Australia, I suppose. And, uh, and I think he's sort of trying to subvert that in, in some way, certainly in this work. Um, so I think, yeah, I think I might actually leave it there and um, open it up for questions.